Nice to see you, Graham. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to a comedian whose work doesn't come from the CIA's comedy desk. <laughs> you know, I've been trying to get on that CIA comedy tour because I hear it pays well, but they just don't <laughs> seem to want to hire me because I keep saying uh, the same thing JFK said, which is they need to be uh, shattered into a thousand pieces and scattered into the wind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you and Bill Hicks. <laughs> yeah. But I hope the resemblance ends there, I have to say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, t t talk to us about, about Julian. Now, you and I haven't had a chance to talk before, mm -hmm. and I know you've been uh, a very staunch uh, advocate on his behalf, as have I. So it's, it's a, again, a pleasure to be able to join you here today. But, but what, what, are your, what are your thoughts at the moment on, on what seems to be his uh, imminent seizure by the authorities out of that uh, embassy. Well, it's it's pretty insane to me. And uh, I mean, something that, that you touched on a little bit with regard to Alex Jones, there was a handful of actually progressive people that, that defended him, Jimmy Dore being one of them, Glenn Greenwald, but, but no one in the mainstream corporate media for sure. And while you know, I, I like somebody like Alex Jones, I don't agree with him 99% of the time. The fact that they can come, you know, block him and then what they've done with the Abby Martin of Empire Files and it's just indicative of what they're doing to Julian Assange is the, is the fact that, and, and, I, and, I, and I say this all the time, I say this on these vigils all the time and I say this to other people who aren't paying as close attention that if they can, they can do. They can do this to any of us. If they can, if they can, if they can, they can do anyone. Anyone. If they don't like your speech, man, they can jail you. If you're a threat to the power structure, the 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 you know the oligarchs and the kleptocracy that we have here in America, to the military industrial complex, then you you're they they will find whatever means possible to take you down. And they have two tactics. They either smear you. If that's if you don't play ball, or they buy you. So if they buy you, then you go on, you get to go on MSNBC or CNN or Fox or whatever, and you get to spew their, their propaganda and you cater it to this, the right side or the left side, depending on what um, professional wrestling character they're having you play that day. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of alarming and the, the people, uh, you know, and you, you were also talking about they'll, do, they'll use whatever smear tactics they can. Whatever smear tactics are available to them, they will use it. They don't care. Whatever, you know, and they're monitoring everybody. So they know they have, you know that they have, and having talked to Susie Dawson about Vault 7, they have the a analytics. They know that, oh, there's a rise in people talking about socialism. So now they're gonna come, they're gonna come back down on it the way they did and they're gonna equate socialism with uh, Soviet era communism and say that those are the same things. And this is the tactic that they use. And once you understand that it is just about their money and their control and everything else is theater, everything else, like they want us split up as red state, blue state, and I watch M MSNBC, I watch Fox. They want that sort of, it's the same thing as I'm a Yankee fan, I'm a, I'm a Red Sox fan. They just want us in that capacity because it, it, it distracts us from the fact of what they're doing. Julian Assange is a political prisoner. I don't, there's That's no other way to put right. it. He's a political prisoner just because, I mean, he's, he's kept in a building, <laughs> he can't see his family, he has no contact with the outside world. Explain to me how that is not solitary confinement. So it, it's really, and, and the fact that the, the, the team, they've been so successful at keeping everybody in their tribe and their team, then like you say, they, they, they accuse him of rape. So, oh, social media, he is guilty, he's a rapist. And even though he says, I, I, I would gladly, when he said, I will gladly stand trial. I'll stand trial, but you just can't extradite me. They wouldn't agree to that. It's like, right. that's an innocent man says that. Somebody accused me of something I didn't do, I would absolutely want a trial. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it, just as a point of information, uh, those tuning in may be interested to know that there's, there's an absolutely devastating analysis of that whole Swedish case by Celia Farber, a journalist who has a site called Truth Dig, 
And that, I, as far as I'm concerned, is the definitive work absolutely nailing that case. There's nothing to it. There's no evidence for it. It was a political hit job, right? Meant, as you say, to, to, to silence him. And, and all of this, you know, they, they, they sort of provide cover for themselves by constantly accusing Russia of being the one that's always silencing critics, killing journalists. I mean, the last I looked, Michael Hastings was a journalist who uh, bought it suspiciously, right? Uh, nobody has said anything about him as a victim of Putin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want to add, too, that you, you, you nailed it when you noted that, that what they want above all is to keep us divided, right? The strategy of divide and conquer, it, it is an imperial strategy that goes back to the Romans. The British were very good at it. The British taught our CIA a few things about it, right? Mm -hmm. And in, indeed, you know, I think that, that the key assassinations of the 60s uh, uh, Jack Kennedy, Malcolm, uh, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy, all four of them uh, had, had, had recently turned in a more inclusive direction toward a more radical politics, uh, and they therefore posed a significant threat of actually uniting the country, oh. right? So, so they, 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 let me just very quickly say they were well past the point of being bribed, and they were well past the point of being slandered. I mean, they were, they were murdered, right? Yeah, I mean, you bring up an excellent point, which is the minute Malcolm, Malcolm X and Dr. King, you know, Malcolm was very critical of Dr. King. And then right. when Malcolm X, if you read the, the, the autobiography, you know, when he, the last chapter, when he goes to Mecca and starts to see um, Muslims of all different ethnicities and races together, he started to come, him, him and, and Dr. King started to kind of come more together. Dr. King, it's, right. it's, uh, and of course executed when when bobby kennedy started to realize um you know he he started young in his political career as being you know he's joe kennedy's son you know just do whatever you got to do to win you know win 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 right. win. and bobby kennedy started to realize this isn't right the speeches of bobby kennedy and all those speeches from dr king of where he's talking about socialism where he's talking about why are we spending money in, in vietnam when we could be helped there's poor people here in america and Bobby Kennedy was starting to realize that. It's not a coincidence that then they were all executed. Right. Because it's not they would have unified the whole country. That's absolutely right. And that's that's what our masters absolutely don't want. And as you as you note, I think we're living at a moment of unprecedented division, right? I think Trump is a gift uh, from God, uh, or a gift from our oligarchs at any rate, <laughs> because he is he has he has served the purpose not only of dividing everybody really kind of violently, but also uh, of, have, of making, and I, I know you'll appreciate this, of moving countless liberals and progressives to regard the CIA and the FBI as our, our saviors, as our heroes. I hear this, I feel like my head's going to explode, you know? I mean, don't they know any history? I, evidently not. They don't know, the, I mean, they don't know the history from two years ago when they were screaming at the, you know, when 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 Comey reopened up the investigation against Hillary, they hated the FBI. Right now they love the FBI. Like it's just it's it's just it, it's so we live in such crazy times where people on the left are calling Tulsi Gabbard an Assad apologist because she doesn't want another um, ridiculous regime change war. She's a she's an Iraq combat vet who has said I I had friends that did not come back from Iraq, which was a ridiculous regime change war. She's called an Assad apologist by Howard Dean. I mean, it's like- the, That's crazy. The, 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 the right goes so far right and, the, and then the Democrats follow them. Like it's, it's uh, that now the Democratic Party is in favor of war. It's in favor of the FBI. It's in favor of all of these insane things. It's like Susan Sarandon is vilified by the left. I know, it's crazy. Well, what, I mean, why, how do we even call them the left, right? Right. Is it, it's because of identity politics. People think that's left wing. I, I don't believe it is. It is yeah. I think it's actually right wing because it's, it's fundamentally based on, on biology as a kind of determinant of, of truth or falsehood, right? I mean, that's closer to Hitler than it is to Marx, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's insane, and, and I, you know, a lot about Trump. I, I, 
I don't like, but a lot of people are getting engaged in politics. And I think, you know, the protests we're seeing and the strikes and everything. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm back in. Okay. I'm back in because the stream's breaking up. Uh, okay. Well, you're welcome to join us. Um, <laughs> so I think the fact that more people are getting involved. I'm hoping that that's the that's the thing that is going to wake Americans up. There's a famous picture that people were that started circulating after the first woman's march that said if Hillary would have won we'd be at brunch right now and I was like so many people went with that's so indicative of what the problem was. Everyone was at brunch for 8 years while o o Obama was you know putting Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden and 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 Julian Assange uh you know ostensibly behind bars in matter of speaking so i i'm hoping more people wake up i'm hoping more people realize that you know the identity politics just really gets in the way of anybody hearing any truth you know and yeah. I, I would like to see it. I'd like to people to really realize what's at stake. And when you're supporting the war machine, you're supporting the Wall Street, you know, and and you're supporting the the, the corporate state from imprisoning people like Julian Assange. All, uh, the thing is, so well, he's a Soviet spy. All he's done is taken information that whistleblowers gave him and put it out there. He verifies That's it right. and he puts it out there. I don't know how that makes him some sort of Putin puppet. <laughs> well, he's, he, yeah, he's obviously not, but it, it, it is useful to cast him that way, not only to silence an important dissident voice and a, and a genuine journalist, but also to feed the uh, war propaganda narrative against Russia. You know, it, 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 it all works uh, brilliantly, you know. I, I mean, I share with you your, your, your hope that people will wake up uh, but while they are fixating on, you know, which pronoun to use to refer to your own gender and stuff like that, uh, the war machine is is out of control, right? Economic inequality is more egregious than it's ever been. Uh, and then there's a whole litany of other horrors that we really definitely have to deal with. And the only way to do it is for us to talk to each other, right, is to transcend our tribal loyalties and try to rediscover we the people, right? How do we do that? That's a good question, you know. Uh, I'm wondering, are, are, are there, this may be a naive question, but are, are, are there some political uh, conservatives who have joined us in support of Julian's uh, plight? Do we know? Yeah, I've talked to some even on this on this vigil a couple months ago. And that's the thing that is so amazing to me is there, everyone's starting to kind of realize, um, y you know, that this connects everybody. I mean, it, it and I, I think people have to, look at the the bigger issue here which is the war machine will say and do whatever it has to do to keep going and every time they tell us they can't afford you know medicare for all college tuition infrastructure this that and the other thing i just go oh but you got a trillion dollars a year to spend on war you have a trillion dollars right. we outspend the next seven countries combined you know and i, I what right. i try to do is you know, I'm very left-leaning in, in many of my views, and I live in Los Angeles where there's a lot of neoliberals running around here. I try to wake them up to the fact, you know, that uh, Goldman Sachs has been in every presidential cabinet since Reagan. So that's, yeah. just know that's who's, you know, and I, and I uh, many people are, are unhappy with what Trump is doing with immigration. I'm not happy with it either. It was Bill Clinton that first uh, put some of these laws in place. So... This idea that one party is better or worse than the other is sort of, uh, you know, the healthcare industry gives to both parties equally. Um, right. And both parties, you know, are, are <laughs> support the war machine. They voted, they vote to, for these budgets and, and it, it, it keeps going. And, and I, want, I really want people to try to connect the dots. Yeah. You know, Julian Assange threatening the war machine you know uh, chelsea manning was threatening the war machine she was saying why are we in yemen we're st 
we're finally getting a little glimpse of conversations about Yemen in the mainstream media and some politicians are finally starting to go, hey, wait a minute, after that bus of 44 school kids was blown up with American ordinance in August, we're finally yeah. starting to wake up. So I don't know, I try to be positive, but looking where Julian's at and they're about to get him or starve him to death or whatever their, their tactic is or end game, uh, I got to look for hope. Well, we have to. I mean, we're obliged to. We have no choice but to do that, you know, because the alternative is despair and passivity. But I do think people have to face the fact that our, our most fundamental freedoms are, are um, if not uh, gone already, uh, at grave risk of disappearing. Mm -hmm. And that includes the freedom of speech, as we've been discussing. That includes the right to vote. And I, I no longer laugh off the claims of people on the right that there's a move to um, restrict gun rights. Uh, you know, I've been reading around. I, I was quite interested to see that in 1943, George Orwell uh, wrote a very powerful piece for the Evening Standard, the British newspaper, uh, on the essential uh, uh, role that gun ownership uh, plays in protecting uh, democracy, right? Now, this was, he wrote this in anticipation of a possible invasion of Britain by the Nazis. And he made the point that, you know, that, that gun on the wall of the farmer, that gun on the wall of the working man's apartment is a symbol of freedom. I mean, it, it could have come right out of the NRA, you know. But I mean, I, I, I can understand the concern of some principled conservatives uh, with the um, need to uh, reassert the, the part that, 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 that gun rights have played in the history of American democracy, bearing in mind that much of the impetus behind the Second Amendment had to do with s the slave owners protecting their, uh, their status. But uh, what I'm saying is that, that, that the entire um, apparatus of rights that uh, uh, were enshrined in the Constitution to make sure that uh, the American Republic could could survive, those rights are at, at serious risk now of being destroyed. Uh, and it's because the war machine, uh, they, they get in the way of the war machine, you know? War serves empire, right? Republics cannot survive uh, in, in, in an atmosphere of constant war, which empowers the executive, it saps the treasury, it, it, it means the destruction of our rights, right? Uh, so that's, you know, Julian Assange today is basically where Eugene Debs was during World War I, right? Uh, when they got him, uh, you know, they used the Espionage Act to put him in prison for talking against that war. Uh, Julian Assange is the, is the Eugene Debs of today. Yeah, and he got almost a million votes from prison in a country that had, right. I don't know, about 100 some million people in it 150 million maybe at the time um, right exactly which is uh, pretty pretty powerful and i want to say this too um that the where i always follow the money i always follow the profit and while i don't want to see uh, rights taken away the, the the gun lobby profits from a lot from from that from the every time there's a mass shooting they they sales go up so i always am right. like I don't know that they're so much wanting to protect rights as they want to fill their own bottom line, but I don't, we're, we're not here to debate the gun legislation, but I will say that I agree on the sense that um, wherever, <laughs> wherever there's m money to be made, they're going to do it. The private prison right. industry is another egregious crime, in my opinion. And that came into place in the 80s where we always need, a, we always need a, an enemy or a criminal. So we need a war on crime. We always use that term, war on crime. The crime, the streets are unsafe, so we gotta build private right. prisons. We need a war on drugs. Drugs, in my opinion, is a health issue. The American Medical Association calls it a disease. <laughs> so right. we're not having a war on diabetes. Uh, or anything like that. So it's really t whenever the whenever the bottom line is threatened and the control and power structure is threatened, then right. that's what they're going to do. I mean, again, going back to to Vault Seven, the NSA's goal, their end game, is to be able to uh, monitor and control the entire planet. That's 
that's insanity. And 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 when the thing too, going back to what you were saying about, you know, we everyone's like, oh, Russia, Russia. All right, let's investigate Russia. But I just want people to know all the elections we have. You know how many democratically elected officials that wouldn't let American business interests come get its resources and then we had to stage a coup? I mean, Smedley Butler does that, right. that, that book, War is a Racket, and he talks about who he, that, that famous speech that was re, put around on the internet, which was, he said, I was, a, I, was a, I was a button man, you know, I was a muscle man for the, for the American corporate interests and back, going back to the 1800s. And so, you know, I, I saw Chris Hedges on MSNBC and they said Chris Hedges has a show uh, on RT, which is a Russian funded network. They always point that out. That's fair. That's a fair thing. Then you know what we should all do? What Chris Hedges should do is go, thank you for having me on MSNBC, which of course is funded by Boeing, Raytheon, the big pharmaceutical companies, big oil. <laughs> You know, because that's what I point out to my friends who are like, a friend of mine, a very smart guy, said, well, Russia, they're, they're, they're listed as a, as a foreign agent. And, I, and he goes, they're funded by Russia. I said, okay, yeah, but look who buys ad time on whatever news you watch. ABC, yeah. Fox, M I don't care where it is. Look who's buying ad time. That'll tell you who is dictating what can and cannot be said on that channel. Right. So we don't have a free yeah. press. Well, we don't. I mean, as, as one who's been on RT many times, as well as, you know, not so recently, a number of the major American channels, it's only the American channels that make you go through a pre-interview where they basically vet what you're going to say to make sure it's okay with them. RT calls and says, will you come on and talk about X or Y, you know, and I, I will go on and I've often disagreed with them. I mean, they'll, they can handle an argument which, as I noted before, you know, propaganda outlets don't want arguments. Mm -hmm. They want a scent. They want a, they want a choir to sing the same song, basically. And that's why Julian Assange is, is locked up and at risk of uh, abduction by the uh, uh, U.S. government. The media outlets should be screaming at the top of the lung, their lungs that, that a journalist, that a guy that's just putting information out there is in jail. I mean, like, they, they should be... But that's what they do. I mean, they play the game like they always, well, let's play both sides of it. So they always have someone on for climate change, you know, and this, this scientist, Dr. You know, Bill Nye or somebody like that is saying climate change, 97% of all scientists. And they go, well, let's get the other side of it. And that's how they think they're being fair and balanced when the reality is if you had a uh, hundred doctors in front of you, 97 of them said you that smoking causes lung cancer and then the three, there's three doctors that said smoking does not cause lung cancer, but they're financed by, <laughs> by the tobacco industry. You'd question those three doctors and you would see how 97% of all doctors are saying climate change is happening. We need to do something about it. But that's the thing with the corporate media in America. They don't, they want to push certain agendas. They want it's amazing how they really want war. I mean, you saw Brian Williams uh, practically laugh himself uh, when he saw those rockets go to Syria a year ago. Yeah, that was disgusting. It was disgusting. Yeah, I know. Well, it's been, I mean, you know, I, I think, I mean, the, the American media has always been basically pro-war, um, but, but something really changed with the Gulf War in 1991, you know, when they were all basically... Um, functioning as, as, a, as an explicit PR arm of the Pentagon, you know, and from that moment on, it's been pretty much the same, you know, I mean, we, they, they licked the Vietnam syndrome and they did it in a big way, you know, I mean, never again would they allow the media to, to get even that critical of, of, of the war as they were of the war in Vietnam eventually, right? Well, also the images. They, they realized yeah, the from Vietnam, every night everybody came home in, in, in the 60s and 70s and sat around the dinner table and watched American GIs get killed and Vietnamese civilians get killed and it was graphic mm -hmm. and horrifying. You mm -hmm. know, anyone who wasn't old enough to watch that, go watch the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary that's on Netflix. It's very graphic and very, and shows you how awful war is, you know? Right. And yeah. so after that, they went, nope, media blackout. And when the Gulf War yeah. happened in 90, or what was that, 90 or 90, I think, 91? 91, yes. They, 
boom and they're just like let the they just basically played the star spangled banner and showed how great our rockets were and they controlled every aspect of it and they started that control when the major corporations starting buying up all the media in the 80s so yeah. media outlets used to be independent you had independent newspapers you had independent mm -hmm. radio and tv channels and then they started buying it all up and they run and control everything and that's where we are now, and that's why it's left to us to foreground Julian's plight, because it's not going to be happening. It's not going to be happening uh, in, in our uh, liberal press. So I'm, I'm getting a signal from Susie that uh, uh, our time is finished, and now it's your turn to play MC. <laughs> so it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Graham. Thank you and so I much. And I hope we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.